And um, we had a good discussion last Sunday night after church in our ministry staff team meeting. Valia, hello, Valia. Valia's back from Mexico. Good to see you. Uh, we talked about Sunday school for like over an hour, the importance of Sunday school, kind of a need to have a refocus on our Sunday school ministry here. I sent out an email yesterday. If you're not on our email list, I wish you'd sign up because we do a lot of communicating that way. We also do a good bit of it through Facebook. How many of y'all got the email I sent out yesterday? <clears throat> okay, how many of you didn't? Don't raise your hand. Um, you know, the, the primary, the most important ministry of any church, and this church included, the most important primary ministry is our Sunday morning corporate worship. There is nothing that Cedar Heights Baptist Church or any other church does that has a greater significance than its corporate worship of Almighty God. Nothing. And then the second most vital ministry that we have that we do is our Sunday school ministry. Uh, Sunday school does so many things as far as um, discipleship. Uh, in the process of making disciples, Jesus commanded us, told us, make disciples of the nations. He didn't say just win the nations. He said you make disciples. And it's through the Sunday school that we do discipleship. We do it through uh, intensive Bible study. Uh, tonight in the 6 o'clock hour, I'm going to be talking about having a hunger for the Word of God. Last Sunday night, I went over in the 6 o'clock hour on Sunday night, <clears throat> 10 goals, 10 significant goals of any church. And the first one is to have a hunger for the Word of God. So we're going to be talking about that tonight and the next 10 Sunday nights are going to be going over each one of those 10 goals. Uh, significant goals on the Sunday night hour. So tonight we're going to be talking about a hunger for the Word of God. We teach the Word of God in our Sunday school ministry. It's also through the Sunday school ministry that we do um, what we call inreach. That's where we minister to folks inside of our church. You know, it's in those small groups, those Sunday school groups that we know each other. We're in weekly fellowship with one another. And it's in those groups that we're made aware of needs that they might have and so it's through the Sunday school that we do ministry like that. It's through the Sunday school that we do evangelism. We do outreach through our Sunday school. That's the significant, that's the primary tool of evangelism is Sunday school. It's not very difficult for you to say uh, to a friend that you know, hey, would you come to Sunday school with us this next Sunday morning? We meet at 9.30. I'll meet in the parking lot and I'll take, it doesn't take a lot of uh, that didn't take a whole lot of ump for courage or anything like that to do that. And so th it's, a, the, it's kind of the entryway into the life of the church. It's kind of the entryway into the kingdom of God is through the Sunday, Sunday school ministry. Uh, also through Sunday school, we have this really neat thing called um, preschool Sunday school and children and youth Sunday school. So as adults, you know, we can come and be in our adult groups. And then we have a ready-made, safe place for our children to go where they're going to be also taught the Word of God and, and be loved and cared for in a loving environment. Now, a lot of churches, you know, kind of are doing the sort of popular thing, you know, they want to do the small groups and homes. And that's, there's nothing wrong with small groups and homes. But you know what? When you do small groups and homes, you know what you've got to do? You've got to find a babysitter. You've got to find someone to take care of your kids. Well, in Sunday school, that's already taken care of. And it's not just a babysitter, amen. It's somebody that's going to be there. They're trained and equipped to teach your child and lead your child to a deeper knowledge of God and the things of God. And um, it's just hard to beat Sunday school. So morning worship, that's our primary mission of the church, any church, is to worship God. And then the next thing is Sunday school ministry. So this coming year, we're kind of setting aside 2014 as the year of Sunday school. Uh, refocusing, if you will, reliving the vision of Sunday school. <clears throat> and if you're not an active part of the Sunday school ministry at Cedar Heights, I want to personally invite you at 9.30 every Sunday morning. Uh, we'll be here for Sunday school. All right. Here in Matthew chapter 11, uh, Jesus has been doing a lot of ministry. 
He's well into ministry. This is really entering into the last phases of ministry before uh, the Passion Week, before the crucifixion. And he's, um, well, he's got various... Uh, there are some folks, you know, really excited with him and what he's doing, and they've been ministered to by him. And then there are some folks that are, are really not uh, real thrilled with what's going on, with what he's doing, the kind of people that he's uh, hanging around with. The title of the message this morning is Jesus, Friend of Sinners. If you would, stand up with me. I'm going to be reading here verses 16 through 19 in Matthew chapter 11, and then we'll have our prayer. Matthew chapter 11, verse 16. To what should I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to each other, We played the flute for you. But you didn't dance. We sang a lament, but you didn't mourn. For John did not come eating or drinking, and they said, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for... Uh, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus, for being a friend of sinners. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. I think it's a, in, in this particular time that we're in with all the social things going on and in our country, in our nation, in our society, I think this is an important lesson today. What does it mean what, uh, that Jesus was a friend of sinners? Now, if we were to go back 2,000 years to the actual context, the cultural context there in Judea and Jerusalem, um, it has some very specific meanings there. For example, if you today don't have a Jewish heritage, if you're not a Jew by birth, guess what? You would have been one of these people designated as a sinner because you were not a Jew. If you were not a Jew in the Jewish mindset and understanding, if you were not a Jew, there was no way that you were going to be a part of the kingdom of God. You were excluded de facto. Uh, you were unclean. You were not allowed in the temple. You were not allowed to worship God. You were hands off. That you no, We would not have anything to do with you if you were not a Jew. And Jesus kind of said all up side down on its head. You remember, for example, the Syrophoenician woman, uh, that woman that came begging for help with Jesus. And Jesus said, you know, it's not, we shouldn't give uh, food to dogs, to the goyim. And she kept on, and Jesus granted her wish. The fact that he would even talk to her. The woman at the well, this woman at the well, she was a she was an outcast, even of her own people. She was not a Jew. She was, um, if you will, according to them, she was a half-breed kind of thing. And Jesus sat there and drank from her cup, had water drawn. And the disciples, when they came, they were shocked. She was an unclean woman, according to their tradition. And he sat there and talked to her. And that he would even drink from her bucket, if you will was just totally unthinkable because she was, quote, unclean. Uh, Jesus would sit down with publicans. Uh, for example, Matthew, he had this disciple that we call an apostle. He was a, a tax collector. And oh my goodness, how he hated the tax collectors because they were seen as traitors. They were collecting taxes, not even for their own nation. They were collecting taxes for the Roman Empire. And so they were especially despised especially despised by the Jewish hierarchy because they, like I said, they were seen as traitors to the, to the nation of Israel. And here was Levi, and Jesus went up and called Levi to be one of his personal disciples, this tax collector. So there were many things that Jesus did that were especially hated by the Pharisees. And, and their righteousness was built upon keeping the law. You know, every jot and tittle of the law, the food requirements and the fasting and the cleansing, 
And they had a righteousness of their own. It was a, a, what we would call self-righteous. And they, you know, were haughty and they were arrogant. And if they, if they were walking down the street, and if one of you, if one of us came walking down the street since we weren't Jewish, uh, they wouldn't even walk past us, let alone acknowledge us. They would go to the other side of the street so that, lest they might brush up against us and become unclean. And here's this upstart Jesus going around talking to sinners, talking to uh, embracing publicans, you know, tax collectors, bringing them right into his inner circle. And he was healing the sick. He was touching lepers. With it. Everything he was doing was turning their world upside down. And what he was doing was he was being a friend to sinners. And we can kind of thank God for that. Amen. Jesus, friend of sinners. I want to ask you to turn to Romans 3. We're going to uh, look at our points here for the lesson today here in this third chapter of Romans to kind of emphasize for us today the significance of this and really my goal this morning is not just for us to thank God for Jesus being our friend but how do we become like this how do we become a friend to sinners well let's actually start at verse 20 Romans 3 verse 20 I'm going to read through verse 26 <coughs> For no flesh will be justified in his sight, God's sight, by the works of the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Verse 21. But now, apart from the law, God's righteousness has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets, that is, God's righteousness, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all who believe, since there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. God presented him as a propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint God passed over the sins previously committed. He presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. Now let me promise you that's a mouthful. There's a, a world of rich theological truth in those statements. So the first point for our lesson this morning, and I really want to kind of hammer this home to all of us, uh, because of the day in which we live, because of the social issues going on around us, and because sometimes how tempting it is to be kind of finger pointing, to be kind of uh, critical and condemning, you know, of issues, social issues going on. The beginning point for all of us as believers is this. We've all sinned. And we should never, we should never, ever forget that we've all sinned. That should be the, just the foundation point of the child of God's life is we, I, have sinned. All right. Uh, look at verse number 20. Back at verse number 20. Uh, we're saved not because of works. It's not by works. That's the point here in verse 20. For no flesh, no flesh, no one, nada, not one. I'm in. Uh, Brother Juan, did you like my Spanish there? Nada. Not one. Nada uno. I'm in. <laughs> no one is justified by the works of the law. That was where the Pharisees, that's where the religious leaders, that's where they felt their justification was, was by keeping the law. And they loved their law. Um, they wrote new laws. They had all kinds of laws 
in addition to the biblical laws there in the Ten Commandments and in the first five books of the Old Testament, all of the laws and rules and regulations, ceremonial laws, religious laws, celebration laws. Uh, and they tried to keep those laws explicitly. And what, what they discovered was that by keeping the law, no one is made righteous. That was the power of the law. Paul talks about this. The Apostle Paul talks about this in the book of Romans. He said, what was the power of the law? What was the value of the law? The power of the law was death. What the law did, the giving of the law was to demonstrate, and it took about a thousand years to do so. After a thousand years of having the law, from the time it was given until Jesus was born, we had a, uh, humanity had about 1,200 years to convince itself that no one was going to be justified by keeping the law. In and of themselves, in and of ourselves, we could never meet the righteous, holy requirement of a holy God. It isn't going to happen. Nada. No, not one. No one. So the first point is, we've all sinned. Amen? Anybody here not had sin in your life? We have all deserved, we've all, every one of us have deserved, richly deserved, an eternity separated from God. We've all sinned. Not one of us is capable, is able to keep the righteous requirements of a holy God. Not one. No, not one. That's where I believe we need to be. Uh, verse number 24, Jesus is our Redeemer. I want to talk for just a second about this thing of redemption. Verse 24, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. That word Redeemer, that's a rich, rich Bible word. Uh, the Old Testament word is a goel, the family goel, the family Redeemer. What was the family Redeemer? It was kind of the head of the clan. Uh, families were kind of like little clannish groups in, those, in, uh, in the Bible days. And every family group had its significant male head kind of person. And he was considered the family redeemer, the family goel. And so he had spiritual, very real responsibility for the family. For example, if somebody came into your family and killed one of your family members... Guess what the family Goel had a biblical responsibility to do? He had a biblical responsibility to go hunt down the perpetrator, to go hunt down the murderer, and make sure that his blood was shed, make sure that he was also killed. That was part of the job, the requirement of the family redeemer. Another part of the family redeemer, we see this, for example, in uh, the case of Ruth in the Old Testament, was to make sure that everyone in the family was taken care of. Um, Ruth, you know, was a Moabitess, and her uh, mother-in-law, Naomi, was a Jew, and Ruth's husband, Naomi's son, died. And so Naomi went back to Palestine, to Israel, and Ruth decided to go with her, with her mother-in-law, and stay with her. And as the story goes, uh, she was taking care of Naomi, her mother-in-law, and Boaz was a family redeemer that Naomi was from, from Naomi's family tribe, tribal group. And Boaz saw Ruth and appreciated the fact that Ruth was taking care of her mother-in-law, helping with um, Naomi. And so um, he went to the actual head. Now, we're the head Goel, the head redeemer. And we're not, he's, he's not named in scripture. You can look in the book of Ruth. But he goes and says, okay, what about the land, you know, that was uh, Naomi's husband's? And the guy said, I'll redeem it. In other words, I'll take care of it. I'll, I'll take possession of the land. Well, that was real big of him, amen. And he said, what about this uh, daughter-in-law, this widowed daughter-in-law? Are you going to take care of her? Because that was part of the Redeemer's job. If, uh, if a lady became widowed, it was the Redeemer's job to make sure that that widow was cared for, to take her into his house, if you will, to provide for her, to give her a place to live and, and things like that. And so this uh, unnamed fellow looks at Ruth and says, mm, I don't think I want to take care of her. And so Boaz became Naomi's, uh, Ruth's redeemer. He redeemed her and he took her in. And then she became his wife and she actually became uh, part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. You know that story about Boaz 
and Ruth. Well, that was because he was the redeemer. He would buy back. This is what uh, Hosea did with his wife Gomer, for example. You know, Gomer <clears throat> went wayward, went off with her lovers, ran away, um, had even had children by other folks, and um, ended up on an auction block uh, that when her, her lovers got tired of her, got tired of, no longer had favor with her. And what did, um, what did Hosea do? He went and purchased her back. He went, back, he went to the auction block and actually redeemed her, purchased her back and took her in as his wife. The Redeemer. It's just a very rich Old Testament picture of the family Redeemer. Well, Jesus Christ is presented here in Romans 3 as our Redeemer. And instead of going, now we deserved the death sentence because of sin. We've all sinned, as Paul says there in verse 23. But instead of executing our sentence against us as sinners, Jesus Christ as our Redeemer came and purchased us back with his own blood. He paid the redemption price by dying on the cross. And that's the significance of that statement there. He's our redeemer. We've been redeemed, like we sing, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Our kinsman redeemer. And then verse number 26 here in Romans 3. He presented him to demonstrate his righteousness. God presented Christ to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous, the one who has faith in Jesus. Our righteousness is something that's been declared by God. It's not by works that we've done. Um, in our day, in, in closing, I really want to just talk to the heart of Cedar Heights Baptist Church with all of the issues that are going on. How are we to be a friend to sinners? You know, first of all, we thank God that Jesus is our friend. Amen. It's like uh, the scripture says, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. The scripture says there's no greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did. It's real tempting in our day to look at sinners <laughs> around us in the world and to be kind of, um, kind of harsh, kind of judgmental, kind of criti critical, like I said at the opening, kind of the finger pointing thing, you know. How are we going to be a friend to sinner, sinners in our day? I'll never forget um, years long before we came to Cedar Heights, I was preaching a revival up in northeast Arkansas at a church, and um, as often we would do in revival days, we'd go out visiting. The pastor and I would go make visits in the community in the area, and this particular day we were visiting, and we went to visit this fellow, and he was kind of a, quote, notorious sinner in the community. He was well known for his sinful lifestyle, and the pastor wanted to go visit him. His wife was there, and he was an older fellow. And uh, he actually led us into his house, which we weren't sure that that would happen when we went there. And we got to go in the house, and he was sitting in this kind of a recliner thing, and he had an ottoman, uh, had his feet up on the ottoman, and he was sitting back, and he had his drink over here. And he was being, even though he'd let us in, I think he was kind of wanting to have fun with us, actually, because he was being real snobbish and belittling and ridiculing and he was making I mean, he was really arrogant and hateful and ugly and that's why I kind of think he just wanted to have a little bit of fun with a couple of preachers amen he was wanting to kind of give us two cents worth sort of thing and so as a uh, pastor Richard was trying to share with him and he was sharing the gospel with him and he was the guy was even making fun of that ridiculing that and finally, Richard, I'll never forget, the, and, he, and like I said, this guy was leaning back, kind of reclining, and had his feet up on the ottoman with his drink in his hand. He was having a grand old time. And all of a sudden, Richard said, well, sir, could I just pray with you? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can pray. Yeah, you can pray if you want to. And Richard got down on his knees at this guy's feet. 
His feet are up on his ottoman. And Richard just got down on his knees and just put his hands like on his ankles. And just started crying. Just started weeping out loud. Just, and it was, wasn't phony. I mean, he just sat there and started weeping over this man's life. It wasn't, a word, it wasn't words that he said. My brother, Richard, pastor friend, was broken hearted over this man's life. You know what? That man quit laughing. As Richard sat there and his tears kind of washed this guy's feet. Now I don't know the outcome. I don't, I don't know if the man ever turned his life over to Christ. But I've, I, I, I'll never forget that moment as my pastor friend wept at the feet of a man that was mocking him and ridiculing him. And Richard wasn't pointing a finger, wasn't condemning, just sharing the truth of God's love, weeping at this guy's feet. You know, I think that's where we need to be, church. I think in this day that we live in, I don't think, I don't think the world, I don't think that the world's going to respond to the finger pointing. I don't think it's going to happen. And I've thought about this a long time, you know. Eternity's a long time. Eternity's a long time for someone to spend without Christ. And I've been asking God, and it's not a real, um, it's not a real popular prayer, I guess, and it's not a prayer I really like praying. But I've been praying, it, it was an old song 30, 40 years ago, you know, break my heart with what breaks yours. Have you ever prayed for a broken heart? It's kind of a sobering thought. Uh, it's real so I don't I really don't like the idea of having a broken heart. But then I think eternity is a long time for a, a lost soul to spend without Christ. I want us to bow for a word of prayer. I think it's real tempting in our day to kind of do the finger pointing thing. And I just don't think that Christ is into pointing a finger. If he was, I don't think he would have come here to die on a cross. If there was anybody that was qualified to be self-righteous and indignant and point a finger it was Jesus Christ <sighs> but that's not what he did he came down and sat with sinners and he was labeled as their friend that doesn't mean he embraced their sin quite the contrary he died for their sin and I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do this. I'm being, I just don't know how to make this happen. But I think it's got to start in our heart. So I ask, I invite you to join with me in these days to pray, and ask God to teach us how to be this, how to be like this. And have a burden like Christ for a very, very, very lost world. Father, we come before you this morning in, in Jesus' name. And all that that in, includes to come before you in Christ's name. To come before you with his heart, with his mind, with his thoughts, with his compassion. We come 
In Jesus' name. Lord, give us the mind of Christ. Fill this church. Oh, Father, flood this church with the mind and heart of Christ. And Father, I ask you this so that we can accurately represent you, present you to this desperately lost world in which we live. So that we can actually accurately present Christ to our needy world. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's stand. Brother Johnny's going to lead us. If you have a decision to make, do that this morning. Whatever God says, let's do that today. See you.